Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode three of Eat, Speak, Compete, a podcast where we talk about everything going on in the esports and gaming world on a week-to-week basis. My name is Yeso, my co-host, as always, Luke Shimona Hebrew, joining me again today. And we have a very special guest on this week's episode. He is a streamer and professional Apex Legends player for Cloud9. He is a silver medalist at the ALGS Championships from this past Past June, we have Zach Mazer joining us today. Zach, how are we doing today, my man? I'm doing good. It's early in the day for me, you know. Just woke up, knock out this interview, have breakfast, maybe stream a little bit, and call it a day. Awesome. Hey, appreciate you uh, taking the time uh, to join us here today. So excited to have you. Uh, Just want to start uh, for you, if you could just kind of introduce yourself to our audience. You know, we're kind of, we cover a lot of different topics in the gaming and esports space. So some people may not know you. So uh, just kind of, what are you all about? Where do you come from, my man? Um, I'm pretty new to esports and like the grand scheme of things. I've always like played video games, but never anything competitively. I was always more into like a normal sports not esports and in like 2019 i kind of like picked up video games more as like a i'm falling in love with this i have to find a way to make it a job that was in like 2019 and then i don't even know time flies so fast how soon i was i signed to FlyQuest, but FlyQuest was the first org i ever got signed to so i kind of went the bottom to like something pretty quick it just had a lot to do with like work ethic and working hard and putting in the time and now I just sit on the internet and speak my mind, talk shit, and have fun with my friends. Love Great. it. <laughs> that's the that's pretty much the dream, right? So I mean, honestly, though, only like two years or so, right? Assuming it's 2019 is your start. That's that is a pretty quick rise to fame, if you will. So um, FlyQuest being your first team that you were on, and, and what game was that for? That was Apex. That was Apex, early on right? in Apex. That was uh. We didn't get to go to X Games because we didn't get signed in time. We got signed like right before it, so there's no way we could have secured an empire or anything like that. But uh, I was around that time. Solid. Okay. Well, you. Yeah, I know you. T- you kind of quickly glanced over, but you said it was mostly because of you know your work ethic and just the grind that you've been putting in. And I even saw kind of earlier this month um, you kind of tweeting about some success you've had on your stream and how you've been obviously just grinding hours and you've been seeing the results as far as just viewership goes. Um, so tell me a little bit about what that, you know, what that work ethic looked like, you know, what you really did over these last two years to, you know, take that, you know, love of video games, if you will, and really turn it into your career. Well, it, it kind of started like, um, at the, at the beginning and in, in like anything, it doesn't have to be esports. You're always going to be like absolutely fucking lost. But if you have passion, like you're going to put in the time anyway. Right. And so at first it was like me just putting in a ridiculous amount of time to like get better. And while that did work really well for me, it, after I got to a certain point, it was like, how can I work smarter and not harder? Right. I think I have one of the most hours in the game between all the pros. I think I over seven K God knows how close I am to eight K. I don't that I haven't checked that in a grip. But that being said, it was around the fly quest time. I started to like think like how can I work like smarter you know how do I actually like get better this this and that and on like solo ranking could be like a really good way to get better better even though you're like you're actively losing brain cells and then um constantly playing with people that are better than you uh, a lot of people will be able to relate to this when I say like when you're playing ranked with people that you know are better than you at the game it can be a little like intimidating like you're you feel like you're constantly every single second of the match playing a game of catch up and you're doing your best to like do your part right and um that's that's super important because you'll grow faster playing with people better than you yada 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 you know because so spending a lot of time playing with like like on zoom blue how and whatnot when i was like the beginning beginning of me playing apex like really helped me see what some of these other players are doing what i wasn't doing and then grow and then future grow past them obviously that makes sense. I mean, you obviously, just you, you name drop a couple of the the biggest goats in the space, right? You got TSM, Hal, you got Complexity, Monsoon, etc. CLG, Lou. I think I think he's still on CLG. Wait, no. Uh, he's who on. knows? He's on. <laughs> yeah. Who knows what's going on? Yeah. Who knows what's going on? Man? Well, CLG is well, kind of a dumpster. Yeah, we'll leave we'll leave that one for a different different topic. But um, 
Obviously, I, I totally agree. I think that's a that's a huge piece of it. So, you know, around that fly quest time period, then obviously playing with the the greats and continue to try to improve yourself through that sense. But then also, you know, was it was it something that streaming specifically you feel like helped a lot in that sense as far as the working smarter not harder piece? Is it is it something where you kind of you know stopped trying as hard to just be the best at the game on the game side and really try to focus on like your social media content and your live stream content start seeing kind of the fruitfulness on that end because obviously you know now representing cloud nine one of one of the biggest gaming orgs in the entire space it's you know obviously your digital presence has a huge component to that so do you think that that's really kind of like the main key factor um it's definitely one of them I, I i'm still very young and very ignorant but at the time i was even more young and more ignorant so I was like, I just got signed to FlyQuest, and I did not give a shit for streaming. And one of my teammates also didn't either. We actually, like, hated streaming. We, like, despised it. We thought it was super, we thought it was a waste of time. Like, why? Like, I, I don't know. Back then, it's hard to even, like, understand my mindset back then, because now I stream 250 hours a month, and I love it, right? <laughs> right. But, um, it, it was, it was definitely strange. It had nothing to do with, like, uh any of that honestly it was like I, I don't know how to say this except for just being straight up honest and a lot of people just won't be as honest with me when i say this but when you're that young and that ignorant and you're getting that good at video games like really fast because keep in mind i was like dog shit months before that and i'm just rapidly catching up because i'm playing much better than me and i'm learning very fast and paying attention right i like it's not that I started to chase the clout, but I started to see the clout in the distance. And, and, and any person who tells you that they never saw it or never, it clout had nothing to do with it ever is just fucking lying to you. That's just the truth of the matter. I was finally starting to get good at the game. I had like 800 followers on Twitter, and I was like, holy shit. Like, I don't know why, but 800 followers was like <laughs> cool to me at the time. And I was like, I really wanted to hit like 1,500 followers. And then it was like, it was like that chase for followers initially was like why I really wanted to start streaming and whatnot because I really wanted to get verified on Twitter. Right. right. Now this is, I'm keep in mind I'm 19 years old, still ignorant, but then I was a little bit more tunnel visioned by it. And that was originally why I like first started streaming. And then I realized like how cool that shit was. And these people literally just wake up, go about their day at work, you know, they'll throw you on the TV and whatnot and they'll just, throw your shit up, you know, drop a sub and chill. And like, it's just a really cool environment that beneficial for everyone in, involved pretty much. So, I don't know. It, I I don't, that's kind of like the true story behind it, but I don't think a lot of people will be as honest as I was when it comes to that. I love that. I love that piece about the streaming component. So I guess now that you kind of uh, have changed from not wanting to stream at all to streaming so much, and uh, I'd love for you just to talk a little bit about, you know, I guess your community. Like, how is your streaming community? Like, what does it mean to you? Obviously, you now you mentioned people just dropping a sub and hanging out at work, just kind of watching you throughout the day. And I know that we do tons of that here. You know, we love throwing uh, your stream and all of the other streamers that you mentioned as well, just up on our big screens while we're out here, just grinding away and setting up for the streams and whatnot. So talk to me a little bit about your streaming community and how much that means to you. And, and how much you know obviously you you love shit talking and whatnot on the <laughs> internet and all that kind of jazz with twitter and things like that but again it's it's a lot of engagement with your community so just talk to me a little bit about that oh it's uh it's like i don't know that's probably like the the best part and the worst part right because it's like uh something that like i don't even think you'll think about honestly even bringing up the question or the average viewer will think about is like how big of a double-edged sword it is like interacting with your community is the best part about it because there's so many people that care about you there's so many dope people that support you financially in so many different ways right totally but it goes both ways because every single time you let out a tweet or every single time you go live your statistics are being tracked and those numbers are money right those numbers are money whether it's a tweet instagram post a story anything it can even go as far as snapchat shit right so it's a really double-edged sword because i'm finally getting to that point where i'm now realizing that like it's not all about your community and sometimes you have to do you do have to pay attention to your numbers and those are very important as well right and it's this double-edged sword where it's like i want to stream league of legends i want to stream valorant i want to stream apex i play video games like 14 hours a day it's super unhealthy but it's just the way it is and like, I, I would have no problem streaming all 14 hours of it, right? 
But but then your numbers. If I go stream League, yeah. I'm gonna get like 50 viewers. If I go stream Valorant, I might get like 130. If I stream Apex, I get anywhere from like 200 minimum to like 2,000, depending on who's live, right? So it's it's uh it's starting to get to that point for me where I'm starting to see like this is actually like dope, but it is work, and I do have to take it seriously, and I do have to be mindful of the numbers and engagement is so sick because I do get to speak and get to know and interact with so many people that support me however I have been like cutting back on it because it's like I'm tweeting like three times a day four times a day five times a day people are less likely to interact with my stuff right because right air all the time yeah, type do that makes sense and then it's I a just... double-edged sword yeah no it, it definitely makes sense right because you know we hear it all the time people always talk about the the jump from uh, hey, I'm a Apex Legends streamer to hey, I'm a variety streamer, right? It's such a difficult bridge to to gap or to error find. Yeah, because especially since you know your following is Apex Legends based, right? And you know a lot of the times people do only play maybe one or two games or are really involved in one or two communities at a time. Um, so you know there's there's not ever too much crossover in that space. And so maybe Apex Legends and Warzone, right, might have a little bit more of crossover, but then you jump into League of Legends and it's just like whoosh, straight down, right? So. You know, but obviously still being able to pull, you know, 50 concurrent, have those dedicated viewers watching you as you play these other game tiles as well. Uh, I personally feel like, you know, becoming a variety streamer not only is one of the most difficult, but also one of the most fruitful things that you can do, right? All of the variety streamers from, you know, years on in, right? Like you got the Summit 1Gs and things like that who, you know, are just such legends in the space. But yeah, that is definitely a big, uh, big bridge to gap, so. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, you talked yeah. about that, that double-edged sword, Zach, and... Uh, you were talking recently, it was about a month ago or so on Twitter, but talking about uh, trying to make really a, a conscious attitude shift on your streams. Uh, you wanted to be more positive and nice and try to bring uh, a, you know, a bit of a different attitude to uh, your streams. Was that double-edged sword kind of one of the motivators behind that? And, or what really kind of was the driving force there? No, I had nothing to do with like um, impressions or be like, I, dude, it's just sure. like, I'm, I'm super competitive and I don't get my competitiveness from video games or esports or any of that. I have my, like, my build is from like playing hockey or MMA when I was younger and my, not to like start that whole argument, but I feel like that competitive drive is sometimes especially in north america a little bit more stronger than an esports drive because sure uh people don't necessarily understand how physical some of those other sports are and how much you actually have to sacrifice to actually get good at some of the sports you know so there's so much that goes into it same with esports right i've done very good in both so i get to have an opinion on both these <laughs> however it's like it's much easier to slack off in esports or be lazy in esports and still find success right it, that's just Again, my opinion, right? So that being said, it's like, I'm super competitive. Like it's, it's so bad. So I can't do anything unless I'm good at it and, and I win. If I don't win and I'm not getting better, it drives me fucking crazy. Like actually, right? And um, I can get really negative sometimes when obviously I'm losing a lot. Way when I'm trying, right? So that's kind of the driving force around like being more positive and whatnot because I was dying to whether it was whether it didn't matter at the time whether it was like my friends and other pro players and streamers or if it was like your random like platinum four trash can that was like <laughs> playing Revenant or whatever it was right if I just yeah. died and got like bullshitted right by like a 300 ping player or uh, a rev octane team who has like one KP and there's like four squads left like I would just go off. Like there was, there was no limit, no boundary. I would just go off. It could be 15 seconds. It could be two straight minutes. And then I was fine. But that 15 seconds to two straight minutes was always really bad. Mm -hmm. And it would play with my mood, right? And it was forcing me to stream like, I don't know, like four to like eight hours because at a certain point I'd finally just get tilted enough to just be like, right? And part of the reason people watch me is for that because that's just sure. Like, but. <laughs> I think they'd rather watch me still have those moments, but also be more positive. So right now, I'm still very capable of losing my shit. Definitely still do it at least once a stream. 
<laughs> However, I'm, it's much easier for me to hit like the 10 hour mark or the 12 hour mark or the eight hour mark every single day that I do go live because, you know, a little bit more positive environment with some good music in the background, some shit just being calm. When shit hits the fan, you're just like, ah, oh, fuck it. Well, that's part of the it's growth, I feel like, right? Of, of, being it's helpful. A, of being a pro player in the space and, and really kind of rising to fame, if you will, um, and really hitting the achievement marks and the, you know, placing within the large scale tournaments it takes a lot of mental fortitude in that sense um and it has to come from somewhere you know i don't i don't think a lot of pro players with you know the competitive drive and the passion of yourself um are able to just you know be like oh no it's all right we, we lost that one right like it happens right you got like the it's timmies of the world that are just like so obnoxiously positive all the time <laughs> and you're just sitting there watching you're like how bro like i would have lost it like 12 games ago i would have been turned it off i'm playing a whole different game whatever it might be but um i think that that kind of you know growth right you were talking about you know you've only been in the space for two years and it seems like you've grown a lot already and obviously your results shine through to you know keep it going. So I think that's a, I think that's a feat in itself. And I think that continuing to um, work on that positive mindset and attitude will just continue to bring you better results. Yeah. If I can keep it up. Shit. We believe <laughs> I got my fingers crossed. I yeah. think you got this. Uh, let's turn, yeah, same, let's turn more towards uh, the competitive side. Uh, obviously you've been now competing with C9 here uh, under that banner for a couple of months. Uh, and you brought on, you mentioned him a little while earlier, uh, Albert Laley joining the squad with you and uh, Naughty. Um, how has that entire process of bringing on this new third Ben, just kind of incorporating him into the roster and shifting kind of how you guys play? Um, it's, uh, it's been like so far so good because, um, we are obligated to do certain things and from the outside in, it looks really bad and I just don't care. The outside in, it looks really bad, but there's certain obligations that I knew I'd have to go through when doing this bop with C9 and we all figured all this out. And one of those things would be like different team comps and uh, different like people on different characters and who's IGLing, who's doing this, who's doing that type deal. Alba is a very um, vocal player and so am I. Uh, on Team Liquid, uh, one of their biggest problems they've talked about publicly, arguably their biggest problem was that Nocturnal really liked the IGL, but Alb really liked the IGL, and they would go back and forth, and one day Alb would be better, the next day Noc would be better, but neither of them ever felt like one was like significantly better than the other enough that like they could commit to one or the other. You're going back and forth now. Really bad. So, um, Alb, Alb feels like he never got a true opportunity to IGL on TL, and then obviously when he was on TSM, they did fucking insane, and how was the best IGL in the game at the time, and, and it wasn't close at that time. Um, so he obviously never got to really IGL on the TSM roster either, and he feels like he's a pretty confident IGL, and he feels like he can do it really well. So I knew that bringing him on to C9, he would want to uh, get that opportunity. We uh, tried a good period of time with me IGLing, and there was definitely some obvious growth uh, towards the end. We started placing a lot better. I think we were like uh, off rip. We were averaging like 13th through like seventh placements. And then towards the end of me, I gelling with uh, our team comp, we're getting like fifth, fourth, thirds. And then uh, this past week, we started Alb I gelling because he feels semi like confident in all of it. So we did uh, pretty bad this past week, but obviously you can't expect like good placements when it's like his first time or anything. I don't really have a problem uh, giving it more time and like throwing. What people would consider throwing away more time so that Alb feels comfortable and saying that like he got an opportunity to do it or we could see him grow into like crazy good IGL either or I don't I don't really have a problem with any of it but a lot of people from the outside in don't really see like how much actually goes into um a roster swap of like this magnitude I guess dropping Noct is a big deal because he's a really good player and Alba is a really good player and they both do very different things so it's definitely not something where, like, overnight we're just the best team in the game. And that's how it was for NRG as well. Just a perfect real-world example. NRG is one of the best teams in NA, probably in the world, because their play style at land should be really good. And, I mean, for the first four months of that exact roster, I don't think they had a single good placement. I can't think of a single top five in the first four months of them playing together. 
and they figured out and they're one of the most dominant teams right now so definitely a lot of growing to do and i'm excited yeah that's awesome honestly and i i, I completely agree with you and it seems really like uh, the perfect time, right? You're coming off of a good placing at the ALJS Championships in June. Uh, it, it, you know, that's the time, if any, just after a big tournament like that to make the changes. You've got plenty of time uh, to work up to your guys' you know, starting to kind of peak. You've got uh, the ALGS, you know, new format, new season coming up. Uh, and I do want to break that down uh, just a little bit for the people at home before we kind of get into the nitty gritty of the new system. Um, but the way it's going to work this year is we're going to have uh, the ALGS Pro League uh, for all of the different regions. We will have uh, invited squads. You guys obviously are one of them that will come in. There are two splits of the ALGS Pro League, which will go into uh, then playoffs. And then all of that will eventually then feed into the international ALGS Championships next July. Uh, as I mentioned, you guys are going to be in the first split of Pro League. Obviously, there are also going to be teams playing up through uh, qualifiers. When you look at the format as a whole for the season compared to what you have competed in prior, uh, are you are you excited about it? What, what are your kind of thoughts on this new format for ALGS? Um, I think it's a really, really, really good change. But Obviously, until anything's proven, it's obviously going to have its worries. So, um, pro leagues, before they ever start, are always scary because pro leagues are, what's the word, I guess, isolated. So, with that being said, if something's isolated and whatever is isolated is a meme, then it's really bad. So, I'm very excited. I think this is a step in the right direction. I think this is what we needed to do. I, I Everything is perfect in my head except for the fact that NA Apex Legends work ethic is like so sad and bad and some of the players and quality is so sad and so bad and they don't even make like an active effort to actually get better either, which is just even more sad and bad. So with that being said, something like a pro league where they actually invited 20 teams, right? And there's probably only like six or seven teams who probably deserve that invite who actually try their hardest and are really trying their best to get better. There's um, there's definitely a spooky scenario here where we get into an isolated pro league. Some of these invited teams just like don't give a fuck. You know, they just kind of throw it away and they just like treat it very lackluster. I think for the pro league, this might be a bad idea, but I think for the original pro league, I think it would have been better for everyone to have to qualify and there'd be zero invites so that people take it seriously. They feel like they've earned it. Mm -hmm. Um, There's definitely some teams in there that don't have the most consistent placements and there's definitely some teams left out that will probably have more consistent placements and uh definitely definitely nervous about that part that's just my only worry but um yeah, i think if i had to give it like an overall i'd say like 99 percent chance it goes well but there's a, obviously that yeah i'd love to i'd love to keep to, uh, touching on that piece specifically a little bit because you know it, it reminds me obviously the new structure of the lgs reminds me a lot of series e in the sense where you know we have that pro league component where the teams are basically invited and they play every week but there's also the open component right where like technically any open teams are able to really kind of qualify themselves in and when we first started series e um you know almost like a year ago now it was one of the situations where there was only like eight professional north american um, apex teams right there wasn't a lot there was really only eight of them and then we even had to bring in eu teams to fill those slots because there wasn't very many fully signed apex legends teams back then um and then of course we had our, our own partner teams that we ended up picking up and as series these continued to develop and algs etc and apex legends in general we've had tons of new teams coming into the space and it, and it has kind of come to that scenario where now it's like we need more slots, right? Like it's almost like we do need some kind of qualification process for those pros because there's so many pro teams now or pro orgs now that are coming into the space and trying to, you know, get a piece of the pie, if you will, um, that it is kind of interesting to see kind of who they chose to invite and who they didn't choose to invite because there's a lot of politics in that space, right? Where it's like you want to invite the best players or the players that have the best uh, ratings, but then there's also like, okay, you know, maybe we don't want to bring anyone that's too controversial on. Maybe we, we need to make sure we get the big orgs for the impressions and the viewership, et cetera, right? So there's a lot of, like, politics, it feels like, in the, in the a sense. A lot of politics. Yeah, a lot of politics in the sense. But at the same time, with the system having qualifiers and relegation, you know, there's, there could be a lot of turnover. You know, we could see a lot of these 
pro teams that got invited really only be in the league for a couple of months and then end up getting relegated directly out. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, I think it'll be interesting. I think you're right. You know, we got to obviously wait and see, see how it pans out to start. Um, but I would say just based on esports arena's experience of like starting series E and really just inviting those pro teams on, um, it, it seems, it feels like it kind of makes sense. It feels like, you know, there, there's a lot of potential for it to really go well. Um, but I'm definitely, I'm definitely excited to kind of just see how those open nights turn out, how the, you know, the amateur play looks, how the qualification process goes and really see what that relegation process is going to look like, because that's when the things are really going to start hitting the fan, if you will. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I actually see it the other way around and ironically, um, you have a better view on your system than I do, obviously, because it's your system. But I feel like I say that around. I, I really do feel like the open night, while the quality may be way worse and the players might be way worse, it's the those players are actively trying to get better. And while it may be very lackluster to what like LGS is and whatnot, it seems like those players are trying to get better. You know, or like you'll go watch the pro night, and uh, a lot of teams are just throwing it away. A lot of teams don't care, and including my team sometimes. Right, it's just the truth. But uh, that's kind of how I view it, and that's that's where the worry comes from, right? Yeah. Like you have the pro night, you have the open night, and it's very obvious in majority of the open nights that those kids that are actual randoms, like you see their name, you're like, what? Are like <laughs> they're they're applying themselves, you know? They're putting in the effort and they're trying to get better, you know? And that's awesome. I love you say that because literally a lot of the teams are invited, then they still don't give a shit, and <laughs> that's where the worry comes for the pro league, right? But the relegation in the pro league, I don't, I haven't read too deep into the pro league. Uh, I honestly forgot about that part. That's huge. That is massive. Um, something else is the format. I think you brought up. I think it's like round robin, something like that. I actually think while that may be a little bit less competitive, I actually like it more. Um, which is not normally in my opinion. I normally just like it as competitive as possible. But. I, I really like the idea of doing the round robin format. I think it's the best way for the viewers and the players because we get a lot of games in, a lot of practice, a lot of play time. There is so much for uh, any coaches, teams that have coaches, to like take out of that and apply to like playoffs. And there's just so much you can get out of it. I really like that. So, like I said, if I had to give it like a Steam review, it'd be like 99% <laughs> up, 1% down. And that 1%. That one percent could be fucking catastrophic. Oh, that's sure. that's a fact, yeah. <clears throat> but we'll see. I, I uh, I'll touch on one last piece before I before I stop harping on the piece because I'm always every every episode we do this I'm always complaining about North American practice. <laughs> like I it's like my number one thing I always complain about in our whole region across the board. Mostly it's in League of Legends what I'm usually complaining about, but it obviously applies really across the board where I feel like a lot of other regions just have. A much better practice regimen than us and because of that you know we're, we I always feel like North America is a little bit behind on a lot of like the meta plays or whatever it might be um, so I, that's one of the main reasons why Series Z exists in general is because we try to create a, a, a practice environment if you will for teams like you mentioned that are trying to get better right trying to improve because it's hard to even get that type of experience because you know you can only play solo uh, solo ladder and lose those brain cells for so long as you <laughs> as you were talking about earlier right so um, I definitely hear what you're saying in that sense I, I agree that I would also give it a pretty high steam rating and I'm excited overall to see how uh, it all pans out yeah uh, it definitely is pretty frustrating to like look at games like league of legends and see, uh no disrespect to my own org or any org of course but, uh like how far behind na is from other regions. i mean it i mean 99 percent of the time it's uh literally comical for the orgs themselves as well they um it's gotten to the point over the past two years, I think, where social media managers and whatnot are more starting to embrace the idea of them doing bad versus them doing good for comedic value because that will get more eyes than mm. the idea of them doing good because it's so uh, far fetched, right? And I that's couldn't agree more. League of Legends. I'm not. I'm not too sure about some other games, but um, it seems to be like that is a normal pattern for other games as well. I think uh, NA typically in esports gets off to a really strong start at the beginning and then they fall off later on. Maybe it's cause of work ethic drive, who knows what it is. I think at Apex right now, due to the lack of lands, it's hard to say what it is, what it isn't. But I think um, uh, NA Apex is definitely very top heavy. Everyone will agree with that. Especially when it comes to work ethic. Some of the top teams in NA will outwork any team in the whole world, without a doubt, in my yeah. mind. They will, they can turn their brain off and just do whatever they have to do. Love it. 
And uh, that being said, it's pretty um, sad to see that we don't have a good way to practice because there's some of us that actually do want the best in the world. And there's some of us who just want to make it in esports because they're very different things with uh, very different bars, you know. So. Uh, awesome. So, Zach, we, we talked a little bit earlier. You were talking about the shift of uh, Albert Lilly kind of taking over uh, as IGL right now, and you're kind of working through uh, the growing pains of that. Uh, I'd say it's probably safe to assume one of your uh, goals as a team uh, this year uh, is to win the ALGS championship. Obviously, you were so close in June, taking second place. Um, but I want to look more short term here, uh, especially when you talk about shifting kind of the style of the team and bringing Alba in and having him IGL. What are some smaller uh, goals that you have for yourself and your team uh, as we kind of come up to the first split of the ALGS Pro League? Um, oh, uh, this is going to suck to say it publicly because it's going to hurt a lot of competitive fans' brains. Okay. But, um, uh, kind of just figure the team out. It kind of felt like we were, uh, catching ground, right? We were mm -hmm. growing. Went some, went from like those 13th to 7th place averages to like the 5th, 4th, 3rd. Uh, and we had that like consistently for one week. And then Alb came to us and was like, yo. I really want to do this and I'm totally down to give them that opportunity. Right. Mm -hmm. But now we're working through the growing pains of this as well. And we're not even certain if we're going to hundred percent stick a bit with it as well. Right. So, uh, definitely short term girls is just figure out what the fuck we're going to do. Right. Which I mean, obviously is inevitable, right? It's not like something I'm reaching for. It just happens with time. Mm -hmm. And then the next goal is, um, uh, I, I want to have a top five placement in OT2, all right? Now, OT1, I'm not saying that we're throwing it away. Obviously, we're going to try our hardest, but I'm also going to not set super high expectations for my team when, one, we're not getting any practice because NA Apex out, and, and two, because we haven't even figured it out on our own yet, right? So the first step is then figuring it out. The second step is then, like, filing out all your small mistakes and silly stuff that everyone messes up, but it'll cost you 15 points in a game, right? Sure. And, and it's no big deal because you just go, oh, fuck, I fucked up, man. I can't believe I did this. I hate my life. Your teammates don't hate you or anything. No big deal. But it does cost you points, right? And uh, you have to just go through that to experience it to grow. And we haven't really gotten the privilege to do that too much because there's not much practice. So like you said earlier, while it is the perfect time to do the switch, it's also not because it's off-season, there's literally nothing fucking going on. So it's really hard to practice and grow. There's really, like, kind of, like, no way. It's a lot more of um, theory crafting and predicting and then just, like, running with it and hoping it falls into what you're predicting I do because there's no practice, which is really shitty, but it's the way it is. And uh, yes. short-term goals would be, I want to, obviously, obviously, top 10, even on our bad days, top 10 should be easy. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's just honest with ourselves top 10 should be easy even on our bad days but um uh, i'm not gonna like set the hopes really high for us getting like a third second first place um in the first ot when we're i think like a month out or two months out and i mean shit bro we're like on week one of alibi gelling and trying to figure that out right so we are definitely um in our infancy when it comes to figuring out the the hard parts i guess but once the hard parts are figured out, then it's smooth sailing. Uh, me, Naughty, and Alb have all been a part of multiple different rosters that have all multiply, like been successful. So once we figure it out, getting to the point where we're good uh, probably should be the easiest part, to be honest. Our term goal is to just figure my shit out, get a top five in OT2, and then take that momentum through the rest of the season, be really good in the first playoffs. If we can get a top three in the first playoffs, I think um, it should be a really good time to be a C9 fan. Solid. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. And I mean, when you're bringing on, you, you talked a, a little bit about it uh, with Alb earlier. He has an incredible wealth of experience with top teams. I mean, you're going to be hard pressed to be able to bring on a player with a, as much experience as he does on so many different extremely talented rosters. He, he's played with some of the best of the best in the scene over the last couple of years. So that's got to be 
uh, really comforting to know that you're bringing in somebody like that who this is not uh, somebody, you know, this is not a fresh talent. This is not like a big up and coming player from from just, you know, solo key or whatever. This is a dude who has proven himself time and time again and brings in so much experience to your guys' roster, right? Yeah, it's pretty fucking awesome. But obviously, like, the roster had a really good player before Alba as well. Sure. With proven success and growth. So, obviously, we'd never make a trade like this unless um, it was this exact situation, right? Mm -hmm. So Yeah, it's never a discount, uh, right? We got exactly what we were asking. Yeah. Yeah, it's... um, We got exactly kind of like what we were... were uh, uh, what we predicted, I guess. Um, Alba's... All of those things. I said it's double edged sword. He has so much experience and so much this and that 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 even he has to figure out what he wants to do because <laughs> I mean he has all that. I mean he really is that good. So the blessing and a curse for him. Uh, before we get into kind of talking about just the general news and what's kind of been going on over the last uh, uh, few weeks uh, in the esports scene, just kind of in general, um, our last thing very Apex specific is, you know, there's been tons of talk, tons of news over the last few weeks as some of the biggest names in streaming have been getting into Apex. Obviously, Warzone has been so big for the last couple of years, um, but Apex really seems to be peaking right now, and we've seen Courage, Tim the Tapman, Nick Mergs, Doc, all coming over uh, to Apex Legends recently. They have all been very successful, and it seems like uh, Apex has really uh, grown so greatly in the streaming space because of that. There's so many new players coming to the title. Uh, what excites you the most about seeing all of these big names coming uh, to Apex Legends? Well... Uh, the big streamers kind of come and go with the not necessarily with the views, but what with they're having fun with and they get views with type deal. Mm -hmm. And COD is a really safe bet every single time a COD comes out because I mean, look how big that console. Can be. <laughs> it's it's fucking disgusting, right? So sure, being one of the best or a, a bigger creator already, and then going to one of those games when they first come out is just smart on behalf of yourself and your, your livelihood, right? But seeing them come over to Apex was uh, kind of a surprise, I think, for everyone. I definitely didn't expect it. The game was obviously growing on Twitch. And shit, I don't know. I couldn't give you a timeline, but it doesn't feel like that long ago. I would open the Apex category, and it would have, like, 19 to, like, 25K on Twitch, and that was, like, normal. Mm -hmm. And then when, like, Hal got on, it would go to, like, 30 to, like, 45. And, but then when he got off, it would be back down to, like, 25, 19K, right? That was just, that was it. That was Apex, and and now with or without Nick Merckx or any of these big streamers live, some days we're hitting 100 k So, uh, crazy the, the the growth the game has, and I think what excites me the most is um, um, the batch, I guess, of creators we got. There's a lot of really awesome creators out there, but um, the recent influx of big creators has all been competitive creators. Mm -hmm. They're uh, uh, no disrespect to the other ones or anything, but these are the players that like um, have huge competitive careers behind them. Typically, like what grew their name and their personalities really reflect that. And Apex is a really competitive and addicting game where it's super easy to fall in love with the competitive aspect of it. And you're seeing people like Networks, Tifu, um, their squads, you know, they have their squad, so many people that are playing right now fall in love with the competitive aspect of the game and how different it is, you know. And that, I think that's what excites, excites me the most is that they're playing the game and being like, wait a minute, this isn't just brain dead, run and gun and shoot. There's so <laughs> much that goes into this. This is pretty fucking cool. And that is doing way more for the game than them just streaming. It. You know, them playing the game and being like, wait a minute, this is pretty dope type deal. And it's, uh, it's reassuring for me as well. I mean... Playing Apex when there's only 19,000 people on Twitch willing to watch the game and the prize pools are bad, is uh, it's hard as a pro to convince yourself to stay on the title when I can switch to something like Valorant and then give my best effort at going pro in that where I can guarantee easily twice the money if I went like tier one pro. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's definitely reassuring after all this time to see the game start growing, see the pro league. and that's what excites me the most is to see the competitive personalities like actually enjoying the competitive aspect of it. Love that answer. Solid. Yep. 
That's awesome. Uh, let's get into kind of what's going on uh, over the last week here, and we'll start in League of Legends. Uh, your brothers on the C9 League side competed this weekend. They played in the Losers Bracket Finals against 100 Thieves and sadly uh, fell. They dropped 3-1 to to 100 Thieves, but the great thing is, is thanks to uh, what was a crazy best of five uh, a week ago against TSM, C9 will still be representing North America at the World Championships uh, in October, which is incredible. And I know you have been following that. I know Courage, obviously his 100 Thieves boys, uh, playing really well and winning the championship. He's been following that. What has it been like getting to uh, to see your, you know, your brothers in C9 uh, succeeding so much in this summer? Um... I feel like that's <clears throat> pretty poor wording because I'm pretty sure C9 did pretty dog shit compared to their last split. I'm pretty sure C9 went like well, 35 <laughs> and 2 or something like that. I, they finished sure strong. C9 went like 35 and 2. They finished and strong. They looked good in playoffs. <laughs> was a little, I, don't, I don't know it as well as you might or a lot of fair people. Enough, fair enough, fair enough. Definitely follow it more than me, but I'm very confident that this roster on paper – Paper, my team should probably be one of the best in the game as well. So mm -hmm. I, I totally understand. From paper, um, they should be very, very good and very, very consistent, I guess, is the word that I would look for. If I saw those names on a roster and just saw it on paper, I would expect that team to be very, very consistent. And I think from the outside in and from a platinum League of Legends player's point of view, it's competitive <laughs> in another game. It seems like one of their problems is consistency. All of their um, players, whether it's uh, Fudge or Sven or whoever it may be, right? Um, playing at their highest level system, right? which is, I guess, in theory, all you can ask for from a pro player, but at the same time, that's super demanding of a pro player to be at their best possible. So um, it sucked to see them lose to 100 Thieves, but it also was like bittersweet because I've been following League of Legends since like 2012, literally internationally. Mm -hmm. Like I watch. Watch T1 versus Dan Juan. I watch LCK. I watch LPL. I watch it all. I just think it's my favorite esport to watch. It's so cool, mainly because of the rivalry and yeah. uh, the skill level. But uh, it was pretty cool to see someday win something. You know, I mean, he's been around. He's been a pretty respected name for a minute. Fucking cool dude. Nice personality. I'm glad he caught the dub. If it wasn't you know, C9, I don't want to harp too much on like C9 or anything or their split because you know they are going to world and they. Of any of the rosters going to Worlds, probably, in my opinion, have the best chance at succeeding at Worlds because of their Worlds experience compared to other mm -hmm. rosters, right? Bringing in perks while he may not be playing like Twitch chat expects him to or whatever the fuck <laughs> people publicly want to say. I don't know. But um, there's a lot of veteran experience at Worlds in that roster, and that could do a lot more than just, the, oh, we did better than them in LCS type deal. So I have really high hopes for them at Worlds which I probably shouldn't, and I would be sad about NA once again. But we're going in positive, and that's what fucking matters. I'm all, I'm all about that energy for sure. You know, I, I feel the same way. I'm obviously always in there rooting for um, the North American teams to, to just try to take some sets. Let's do the best that we can. We're on the hopium I mean? right now, we're, big we're, time. Always, always. But, you know, I, I, you touched on it a little bit. I was going to ask, obviously, you, you're a big League of Legends guy just in general. You've been following it for a really long time. Um, and, of course, you want to root for your Cloud9 boys because, of course, you love the org, and, and they did make it to Worlds, which is, you know, a feat in itself. Uh, but I was going to see, it, is, was there a, a roster or a specific org that you've been following since 2012 that you've always kind of been a, a fan of, or is it really specific players that you've kind of been following? following I'd, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on that well i'm gotta remember since 2012 to now i'm still very young so i was even younger back then when you're that young you kind of follow personalities more than um teams because or like spoon shiny type deal it's like Pearson or whatnot you know mm -hmm. so um, mainly like followed players up until probably like 2018 2019 that's when i started realizing like uh, the other regions and watching the other regions as well and seeing the talent over there. Uh, followed, oh God, all the way from back in the day, watching like the, I don't even remember, like when I Will Dominate played on like Curse. Yeah, yeah. OG. I mean, just watching them from all the way, yeah, back in the day, watching those tournaments to 
Uh, then when Bjergsen came around, that was like the new hot shit. Watched that for a couple of splits, was really hooked on uh, the Bjergsen double lift, all that. And then uh, a Sneaky, of course, for Legendary. And then time goes on. Not that they fell off, but other people started to do better. Other regions were just becoming more dominant. I really fell in love with uh, G2 and their personality. Um, it kind of reminds me of myself. The way that they're like kind of dick bags, yeah. but it's funny <laughs> and it, it, it's all banter at the end of the day. You yeah, know? it really reminds me of myself. So I kind of fell in love with that. I I really do follow the the G two uh, team. I followed Fnatic a lot when I was younger because of X Pack A, um, and now you know the previous series this past weekend. I don't know if you guys followed, but G two versus Fnatic was a crazy series. Hell yeah! And Fnatic ended up winning, which was crazy to think that g2 has ever since g2 got into u league of legends i think or lec rather they've gone to worlds five years in a row this is the first year yeah yeah i'm pretty sure this is the first year they're not only not going to worlds but they didn't even place top three yeah, yeah. that's just mind-blowing to so many people so yeah an incredible to look to at as well it, it, it's such a you know and it's still an incredibly talented roster you still got caps who's widely considered to be the be the best western player of all time uh and, and yanko um, so it's obviously you know behind perks of course of course but you know c9 C oh, still of course. yes of course. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no i i agree it's incredible well, to see a historic org like that not go to worlds yeah, I, I mean, who? There's a list of things that could be right. I hate talking on uh, pro problems in other games because I understand how in depth they can be for myself in my game. So, sure. Uh, speaking on another game's pro problems as a pro is kind of ignorant because I have the understanding that it's probably way more in depth than the BCI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, there's, I don't know. It's definitely from the outside in, from like a casual point of view, it's definitely this crazy dilemma where you have one of the top teams in the world. Um, and one of the top rosters in the world, arguably on paper, uh, not even getting top three in the region, let alone falling for worlds. It's like, do you just run it back and hope that it was just a fluke because of their um, history and experience and whatnot? Or do you see that as like a, yo, there's problems here and we need to make changes. And obviously we have no fucking clue. Mm -hmm. All their problems or all their um, instances that went wrong, I guess this season were probably a lot more in depth than but we know, and I'm sure the org and people involved over there, Carlos, have way more ideas than us, and they'll figure it out and hopefully return stronger next year. Because me being a G2 League of Legends fan, I would hate to see them suck again. Because being as good as they were, um, placing fourth is definitely sucking in their eyes, probably. Yeah, it's definitely difficult, right, to touch on those different components. I especially feel like in the esports space in general, you have so much meta shifting and whether or not it's on like the game developer side where there's a new patch or an update <clears> or whatever it is or even just you know the players themselves the meta shifts internally within the game which you know causes certain people to have to switch off characters whatever it might be there's so much there that can really mess with a team synergy right if, if you're not able to play a specific character or whatever it might be could just oh, yeah. really throw you for a turn even if it's in the middle of a split or whatever it might be i know they do their best to mitigate that but regardless like there's still there's so many factors so i totally agree that you know we can we can speculate and, and do what we can but at the end of the day these guys are the best of the best and they lost to more best of the best players um so you know it's, it's there's so many factors there but yeah it's definitely one of those things where um we hope to see G2 bounce back next year and, and bring the heat. I mean, I think that's the Our point I would week. make is that, you know, G2 finishing fourth with the talented names that they have on there is just a credit to the rest of EU. It just shows how strong that region is. And they're going to send three yeah. incredible teams to Worlds. And G2, you know, wasn't good enough this year. But I would be surprised if they weren't next year. So, uh, obviously. Yeah, yeah, same. Huh? You just said same. Oh, same, same goes for C9, bro. Sure. Like, fuck, man. Oh, dude, they definitely, I mean, watching those 100 Thieves games was a little bit painful from the outside in. Keep in mind, I'm a platinum player. I'm god fucking off. <laughs> but, and I have no understanding of the game. Sure. But I love the game, right? And I love watching it. But it's so painful to see people you want to support, like, not play to their full potential. And that's so much to ask for. I mean, it is completely ignorant. That, like, be like, yo, play your best, constantly. <laughs> but... Fuck, man. You know, you always want to see your boys take it home. So I'm really hopeful next year that if they don't, well, excuse me, 
when they win Worlds this year, sure, you know, <laughs> they'll follow that into LCS next year, you know. Exactly. LCS, you know. Lots of lots of hope. Here, what here. could go wrong? I love it though. I mean, <laughs> I I will say uh, la last point, and we'll 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 move on to some different news and stuff. Last point I will say is I I do completely agree with you on the point of C9 brings. Pro, uh, a roster with probably the most uh, international pedigree, right? Perks has won an international title. He won an MSI. He's been to a world's final. Zven has a wealth of experience in international play. And even their young guns are, are uh, you know, incredible players who I think have yet to completely show what they can do uh, at the international level. So I think if anybody is looking at C9 and saying this is the team at, you know, of NA that has the best hope of worlds, I don't think they're crazy. So I think C9 has a great shot. It's going to be a tough test. They're going to have to go through plans, uh, I believe, so they have some extra games to play. But C9 has shown in the past that the extra games uh, are largely to their benefit. So uh, excited for worlds coming up. That is uh, awesome news. Let's talk a little bit. About Overwatch, obviously uh, Blizzard has been in plenty of hot water uh, left and right over uh, the last four to six weeks, and uh, we actually talked about it on a previous episode of the podcast, the discussion around the community wanting them to rename the character McCree, and Blizzard has officially come out and said that they will, in fact, rename McCree. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, McCree was named after an employee who was recently fired who was or who is currently named in the uh, lawsuit from the California Department of Labor. Uh, so it's been kind of crazy and everybody's been uh, wanting a lot of different things, but uh, we talked about it at length a couple of weeks ago. And uh, uh, Zach, what is kind of your initial reaction to seeing something like this happen? Or do you play Overwatch? I guess yeah, do you play so Overwatch? Like, <laughs> I, I've played it before, but I like playing it personally. From, again, there's so many legalities that go into all of this and so much internal shit that we could never understand but at the sure. same time it's like well fuck you, you got serious problems yeah you aren't talking fucking perks is sandbagging right <laughs> we're talking serious fucking problems right yeah so with that being said it's like name changing mccree isn't necessarily what people are looking for it's like good for you right and the last 15 minutes of this podcast has been straight fucking hopium and that fucking McCree name change was straight fucking hopium, bro. <laughs> We're people just keeping it rolling. For, people are looking for, like, ser serious change. People want to see a difference, you know? Mm -hmm. People really want to see uh, a changes. For, I, I don't really uh, I don't really pay attention to it too much outside of what just runs into my timeline. I'm not going out of my way to look it up. Maybe right. that's on me, but... I mean, from what I've seen, from what I've heard, I mean, it's just absolutely fucking disgusting. It's... Um, disgraceful the video games if you're a riot or um respawn or any other company that's operating correctly i mean you you should be ashamed those are like your brothers or sisters whatever you want to call them uh having another staple esport and scene it should be it, it should be shameful to be like riot or respawn right now knowing that blizzard operates right like that and it's uh man it's definitely um it's like esports which is like skyrocketing growth um ability to be like um what's the word one of the largest categories uh, more mainstream yeah. mainstream mainstream sure. mm -hmm. yeah i'm like more mainstream and then just seeing shit like that it's just like it's like so many steps backward it's like jesus christ it's like where the fuck did you guys go wrong that shit was so backwards upside down sad mm. um so in my head not knowing the entirety of everything and Knowing the current things they're doing to do better, I don't know any of it. Um, it's, in my head, it's more like a fuck Blizzard scenario. I mean, pretty sure Blizzard runs Warzone as well, and Warzone, fuck, it sucks. They can't get a grip on it for their content creators. They can't get a grip on it for the cheaters. They can barely get a grip on it for, uh, it seems to be like the CDL. I'm pretty sure there's problems over there too. I mean, it really just seems like a really sad area where Blizzard does nothing fucking right. Um, and I mean, yeah, it's just really straightforward. I'm just like, fuck Blizzard. Hopefully they do better. And if they don't, um, it's more important for all of us to be capable of completely leaving them in the past so that we don't represent that as a as a culture of video games going into the future and bringing our video game culture to uh, normal sports and the normal business world culture, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I like that point. I, I think I, I think we agree for the most part. You know, we, we've talked about, you know, the Blizzard situation in a couple different uh, variations, if you will, and, and really 
the main factor i think you hit the the head on the or the nail on the head there is is just it's the cultural implications of like you know the parents and the new generations growing up into you know like myself i came from the blizzard universe of like hearthstone and world of warcraft and starcraft 2 and those are like my original esports titles that i really got into um so to kind of see it kind of doubling back and, and seeing all the, the the dirty laundry if you will come out um is definitely a a disappointment across the board and um i do i do think that there's definitely some some much larger um work to be done outside of changing the the mccree name itself so uh we'll uh, we'll definitely have to continue to to bring it up on our, our future podcast and stay on top of it and see just kind of as the story continues to develop but I, uh, I think you said yeah. it in some choice words. You definitely can't, like, downplay it either, too. Like, that yeah. shit is just so bad, bro. Yeah. Like, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> Get a crap. Pull it together. Like, it, it, dude, it is it is so easy to, like, like make a joke. Because I've made a couple jokes about it already. Of course. Talking about or, like, laugh it off or anything just us to be like nonchalant about it because mm -hmm. you know like we're not directly tied in we have nothing to do with it so for us it's easy to be like yeah that sucks that's shit and then like make a joke crack a joke understand it sucks as shit and then move on right but nah for so many other people it hits way deeper and then on top of that it's like um well i can't relate to you because i don't fucking play those games thank god shit mm -hmm. company hey don't worry but do I. <laughs> I couldn't imagine I couldn't imagine, like, playing WoW or Hearthstone or StarCraft gr growing up on all that, and, like, all those dev names are probably, like, very apparent to you guys because the company was much smaller at the time, and then seeing all this, like, that has to be, like, a, a, a blow to the gut, like, you, like, you, like, I, it's gotta hurt to know that you put that time into all those titles giving those people money, right? It's like, geez. I mean, again, I've, I've also been in the space for a good chunk of years now, and I've worked with a lot of those names on various events and all those kind of things, too. So, yeah, I, I, you are very <sighs> correct where it does feel like a blow to the gut in that sense where it's like a lot of my esports roots, if you will, kind of stem from that space. So it, it definitely stings a little bit. And Mike Morheim, who is the, the CEO or the original CEO of, of Blizzard Entertainment, uh, released a statement a while back just, you know, it was basically just like a, a public like apology just in general that you know he was involved at all in a fostering of a company that ended up taking a turn into this type of culture and it's just it's not a, it's not a great thing to look in at but again I, I really do hope for the sake of you know their gaming communities that they're able to make the right steps to at least resolve the culture internally so that they are able to continue you know producing these titles that have such a strong legacy and such a strong following yeah, I mean, to just completely discredit them because fuck them. It's like, I, I wonder if those games have the legacy they have because they were so early on in video games or if they are really that amazing, you know? And while I've never played them, I can't really give my opinion on it. It's uh, part of me is starting to think with the, the recent games they've put out and the recent way that they've taken care of them, part of me wants to lean the other way, be even more negative because it's like, really? Like, like a war zone. Look at Overwatch. Look at the way that they take care of some of these games. I mean, it's uh, it's pretty fucking embarrassing. Trust me, we hear uh, you. So yeah, we hear you. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I'm all I'm all for not second chances, but like seventeenth chances when like when all is said and done, <laughs> if they can figure their shit out and it's good, then then like good for you. But like until everything is hammered out and everything is fucking perfect in their world and they have it all figured out, man, fuck them. That shit is sad, gross, depressing. If you work at that company, you didn't know about it. You work at that company, you didn't know about it. You should just feel disgusting. I'm sure you do. It's painful to know that you're in an environment like that, whether you know about it or you don't know about it. Um, it's painful to even play those fucking games. And then knowing that, like, even in my infancy of playing Overwatch for, like, 120 level, which, if you understand, that's literally fucking nothing. Yeah. Like, buying, like, 100 fucking... Overwatch packs or whatever the fuck it was. Like, yeah. even that just feels like shit. Fuck those guys, man. Let's go next, because that's pissing me off. That's yeah, good. We're going hey, next. Go next. We're going next. Uh, have you seen anything about this Fortnite March Through Time MLK event that's been talked about a lot over the last uh, week, Zach? Did you see anything about that? 
No, it'd be interesting to hear what the community thinks because I think they could go both ways really fast. And I, and I also I also missed it. It was this past weekend, so I also didn't get a chance to see it, so I'll definitely have to go back and, and yeah. catch up, but I'd, I'd love so, just to get so the updates. So what Jason. it was was uh, uh, creators in the Fortnite creative community uh, came together and they built uh, what's called you know the Fortnite March Through Time event, which is based around Martin Luther King. Uh, and it is this space where players are able to come in and go explore uh, different landmarks in Washington and relive some moments from the March on Washington and get to uh, see Martin Luther King's uh, I Have a Dream speech all within an environment in Fortnite. And it has been very controversial over the last week. Um, I... I, I've been watching it, I don't know, first blush when I th thought about it, I was like, wow, you're putting Martin Luther King in a shooter. I'm like, that seems a little tone deaf, but okay. Um, I'm kind of split on it personally. I, when I look at it, I see it as, you know, hey, I think it is great to have uh, these opportunities for younger people to get to learn about uh, these things that are very important to the history of our country uh, in, in, in different ways. Obviously, these are things that should be taught in school and are important, but giving uh, kids opportunities to engage with these kind of topics in different way, I think is awesome. Is Fortnite maybe the best way to do it? I don't know. And even at one point, uh, Fortnite, you know, didn't have the foresight to, to do this. They halfway through they had to disable emotes because you got you know kids going into this march on washington exhibit and they're flossing as rick from rick and morty while watching you know martin luther king do his i have a dream speech and uh it, it's been very interesting to watch and uh I, just on first blush i thought it was uh an interesting choice to say the least i like i mean i think there's definitely an attempt um at something positive there um super easy to have a good idea and then it backfire and just overlook something mm -hmm. and uh it's super hard to like give your opinion on this if you're like myself yes um uh, i definitely think there's definitely some uh some good blood some goodwill in there i don't necessarily i can't necessarily say that it was like the best way of going about it right putting ammo okay in the shooter and whatnot and all that but I definitely think that there is some truth when it comes to the younger audience being the first audience in video games. I mean, you look at like Valorant, you look at Apex, you look at Fortnite, you look at shit over, you look at every fucking game, Call of Duty. It's typically the younger generation that are like spewing very uh, sexist and disgusting and racist remarks. It's, it's typically the younger people. All they do here in older voice is typically younger people, right? Um, that's just the way it is. So I think making an effort in uh, being. Uh, I guess the most uh, young dominated game out there, definitely Fortnite, right? Mm -hmm. I think making an active effort in uh, uh, trying to get people of all ages of their entire community to be a little bit more understanding of how monumental that was and how big of a deal uh, it is. Like, I think there's definitely some good blood in it, some goodwill in it. I definitely think they overlooked some things like putting MLK in a shooter, shooter but same time it's like maybe they didn't overlook it maybe they thought about that but they just thought the, the cost versus the benefit like the, they thought it would be better for them to use their platform mm -hmm. even though it may not make the most sense maybe they thought it'd be better to just get that out there again just because if it helps 30 people then like you know like that's that's probably a really good thing you know like if it helps 30 million people then it's probably a really good thing right it's uh trying to look for like the positivity in it instead of the sure. negative because it's really easy to be overly sensitive and find some major negatives in it. Um, while sometimes people do good things and gain goodwill and they do backfire because they do overlook something that's super, super, super major, uh, and it's bad, right? And typically people have to backtrack and be like, yep, didn't think about this, made a mistake, and we're sorry, right? And uh, I haven't really seen the backlash from it because it hasn't been on my timeline. None of the big creators that I follow or yada, yada are commenting on it, so that's probably not a good thing but that being said it's hard for me to give my opinion without putting myself on a side and then maybe ending up at the stake in like two weeks you know i, I don't sure. really want to fucking do that no it's but pretty if fair. i had to give a simple opinion um from base value and not knowing any of the backlash because off the top of my head i wouldn't think of any i think it's a good thing personally i think sure. um 
Fortnite is a very young, dominated audience. I think there's a lot of problems in young people playing video games and not understanding the the violence behind some of the words that they use. And that goes for all ages, but it's more common in young people. Again, just reiterate that. I think Fortnite using their platform as a, a way to help people remember how big of a moment that was in time and uh, just retouch on like all of it. Uh, I think that's a good thing. I think it's a big deal. I think actually there probably should be more of it. I don't think it, I don't think it hurts to, uh, you know, aid the the fight against racism. I don't think it hurts. So I, I don't necessarily understand the backlash at forefront. Like at just what's hitting me right now, just finding out about this. Mm -hmm. I haven't looked too deep into it in my own ma mind or the posts and whatnot and read. So there's probably some very understanding moments on like why it's a bad thing, but um, at face value, I, I definitely see it as being a good thing. It'd be interesting to see what comes out of it in the future. Yeah, I think I agree. I think at face value, I, I definitely do agree. I, I kind of relate it to the only other Fortnite experiences that we've seen so far being the musical um, experiences with like Marshmello and Ariana Grande, Travis Scott, etc. And I think that what Fortnite can produce inside their game digitally is second to none. Like no one else, no other game title has even been close to being able to create that type of experience um, before, especially one that you can share with people around the whole world where, you know, you're all in there, you know, watching it together or interacting with it together, whatever it might be. Obviously, there's, there's you know, a right and a wrong way to do things. And I, again, I'll have to probably dive in a little bit deeper to, to, you know, see where the holes were, if you will. But I do believe that I agree with you on, on the intent side, that the intent's there. I think that the utilizing their platform to, you know, deliver a more engaging experience that also educates a younger demographic at the same time is a, is a really a win-win all the way around. Um, and as it continues to grow and they continue to do it more, I'm sure that we'll, we'll see some of those maybe uh, select emotes only might be available. That sure. makes more sense. Or if it, even if it's everyone's, you know, sitting in a theater more rather than being able to just run around like a lunatic and, and ride a rocket or whatever it might be, um, especially when the, the topics are a little bit more serious in that sense. But, um, you know, there's... I'll, I'll use the Ariana Grande example as it's, you know, it's a full concert. They were all in there. Everyone's having a good time. But then there's this one moment in the show where it's just you and Ariana Grande. Like, it's a one-on-one -on -one experience with Ariana Grande. And it was kind of cool because it was like you were the only two people in the whole room, right? Which, one, is an experience you can't get anywhere, not even at a concert. Mm -hmm. But, two, it's cool because, like, they could also utilize that to really hone in on the importance of certain components or certain moments of, like, the speech, let's say, mm -hmm. and really take away the distraction and let the focus be primarily on the content so uh, i do i think i agree with what you're saying zach obviously we will do a little bit of we'll have to go watch it and kind of see it see it for ourselves but overall it, it seems that at face value that it, it's a pretty beneficial um it's a pretty beneficial thing i think for the the community yeah and i hope they you know i think more importantly than even like watching like the mm -hmm. the, the creative shit or whatever the fuck it was i don't i don't know how they did it but whatever it was i, I think more importantly it is to like go look at the comment section rather actually go through it because i mean it's really hard for uh, at least myself, I'll speak for myself as a, as a white person to like, uh, at, again, at like, right as it hits my head, it's really hard for me to see like what could be wrong in it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I think it's more important to like go through the comments and like try to understand some of the backlash they're getting on it and on maybe why it's bad and then getting your own opinion on it, you know, like educate yourself, read everything up, you know, um, see the the good intent you know see the why this is a bad idea you know and see then outside, and yeah. then build your own opinion right i think that's the most important part because any any person uh could go watch it and then have their own opinion but then be they could be tone deaf to what another person feels and sees in it right so the most important thing is kind of like hearing the other side out you know I, I think that is what i would i would do first that's what probably i'm going to do is just go read the comment section and then be like wait, this person's being fucking crazy. And then be like, wait, <laughs> this person brings up a really good point, right? Because mm -hmm. both sides are going to have, like, their extremists who are fucking idiots on the internet. But mm, there's definitely it. some really good points to be brought up in there, I'd imagine. And I gotta go find out.
All right. Uh, we obviously had a ton of topics we want to cover today. I'm going to cut out a few here just because you've honestly given us a ton of your time and we appreciate it. So last couple things I want to talk about here, uh, I want to go forward to uh, Halo Infinite. We got an announcement on the release date for Halo Infinite. It's going to be December 8th where we'll get the campaign and the multiplayer release and just this morning, as we're recording this, uh, Monday, August 30th, we got the announcement that uh, the HCS has announced their partner teams for the start of Infinite. Your team, C9, will be in on that, along with Envious, E United, uh, FaZe Clan, Fnatic, G2, Navi, Sentinels, and Space Station. Obviously, uh, this is exciting. We've certainly been waiting for Infinite. Super excited for it to come out. Uh, is this a game that you're going to be playing? I know you're probably going to be kind of right in the heart or just coming off of kind of the end of uh, the Pro League season. But is this, you know, are you big on the Halo franchise? Is maybe this going to be your first entry to the franchise? I think that game fucking blows. <laughs> I think that hey. game sucks, bro. Okay. Hot I've never I've never I've never played uh Halo. You gotta remember when I was younger I didn't really I wasn't a big gamer. Right? Sure. So I've actually never played a Halo title. Okay. I don't even the only Halo titles I've watched someone play are like what I've watched the, my my dog Snipe playing on stream mm -hmm. recently. And uh I, I mean look, I mean maybe I gotta do some research on the newer one, but from what I've heard it's kinda like Call of Duty in the sense where it's just like same shit, different day, new year type deal. Where it's like, it's the same game as before. Mm -hmm. It's just out today. And it's going to have a couple small differences. But its core is really similar. And I love a skill gap in the game. Mm -hmm. And I love making it obvious that you're the best player in the game. Yeah. When I watch Halo, again, complete casual, I really, really, really think the, the movement and like the gunplay is like so uh, noob. I guess is the word it's like the movement is pretty slow it's pretty straightforward no one can outplay the other person typically um what i've seen at least mm -hmm. and then um the gunplay is is very straightforward too it's it's TTK is i love it's ttk but with it being a controller dominated game and from what i've heard amos is being super strong in the game as well it's like when someone gets on you it's kind of hard to outplay them you know get on them and then win the gunfire right sometimes in cod you'll see you know like get tagged running through a doorway then they'll jump around the doorway and just fucking one shot the guy when they're on one health and they play it like perfectly where it's like in halo i feel like there's a little bit less counterplay to when uh someone like pulls up on you or whatnot and that's just from what i've seen keep in mind i've probably watched a total of less than two hours of halo in my whole life and i've never once opened the game so i know nothing about the game but i think it sucks i think it's movement is slow i think it's gunplay is not impressive and I think its legacy is what carries the game rather than the actual game itself, which is completely fine. That's awesome. And I support that because it's not fucking Blizzard, so dope. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I'll, I'll start there. Um, I'm surprised. I'm a little surprised by that take, I think. I, I can understand kind of where you're coming from, especially as a, you know, a newer-ish gamer, if you will, and a battle royale primarily as the movement and the overall uh, variety and gameplay of every single game really feeling a little bit different, if you will, because of the RNG components in the game. Um, I can definitely feel kind of where you're coming from, but, you know, as a as an esports vet, if you will, who really grew up on some of, like, the original esports view viewing titles, right? Like the StarCraft 2s, the Halos, the Call of Duty multiplayers, like those type of titles. Something about, there's something about the Halo, the, the teamwork, the spawns, the, you know, you're talking about counterplay, but the counterplay really comes from your teammates, so making sure that they get shots on the other people that they're calling out, you know, rotations around the map, etc. So it really is an incredible viewing experience as far as esports go uh, in comparison yes. to something like the an Apex Legends type situation. So I do think that I agree with you that. will be impressed. I agree with that. And, and I was watching Snipe play the tournament the other week, and mm -hmm. I watched the whole thing through. It was super, super, super fun to watch. Yeah. got to remember with how competitive I am. Totally. I'm totally totally here. Like, yeah. I, I got I to gotta be able to relate and be mm -hmm. like, yo, that's dope. But I was watching it, and it really – it really didn't, you know, it really didn't seem like... The outplay mechanics were there for you? The outplay mechanics were there for me. Yeah, 100%. It really did seem like the teamwork was a, bit, was a big deal. The comms were hyped. The comms were sick, you know, whatever the fuck. It was awesome. Watching it was fucking awesome. And honestly, I'll probably watch the HGS, especially because my own org's in it, one. But two, because it, like watching Halo from what I've seen from Snipe, his shit is, is fun as fuck to watch yeah but the game itself just like seems so it 
I can hear you. I mean, I'm an asset shooter, so I can't really, I can't really help on that end, on that piece. But as far as a viewership component goes, like I definitely, am, I am mostly excited to really see these these big orgs bringing in, you know, both veterans from the previous titles as well as newcomers to the space, um, and potentially even yourself. You know, you got to give it a shot. You know, Zach, I, 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 I know, it's, I know it's controller, but I think he's, I think you will be pleasantly surprised, especially when you're talking about watching, because you were watching uh, the the Halo Two Twitch Rivals, right? Uh, with Ninja yeah. and Snipedown competing that. I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised with the advancements that the franchise has made in terms of movement. Uh, a good buddy of ours, uh, Shyway, he is a, a Halo caster, fantastic, really uh, knows the minutiae of the game well. He did a fantastic YouTube video the other day where he broke down uh, one of the best uh, of the current Halo uh, pro players, uh, one of his games in the Halo Infinite beta, and was able to break down all the different movement and the different techniques he was using. And I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised by by the movement of the game. You may try it and still not like that's it. I think that's totally fine. But I think when Infinite oh, comes out... Oh, my biggest out, problem with it is the movement. Sure. I, I yeah, think like, it is the... Like motherfuckers just be floating and shit. Like, <laughs> you could go yeah. put in your hot chocolate if you go jump. <laughs> like, that is just my toss, toss a is the biggest problem with me, man. Sure. That is, that is, for me, man, I'm speaking for me. I'm not speaking yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, I, I'm not saying that to you. Saying that to all the sweaty Halo like, pubs players are going to be in your, exactly, in your mentions you know? this weekend, I'm telling hey, you. Hey, 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 exactly. Well, that's another great point, bro. You guys brought up how there's very little outplay in the game. Motherfucker, you guys played it. You guys said it. It's a <laughs> lot of teamwork, you know, make sure your team. Imagine the solo queue experience of that game. It might sure. be worse than Apex. Like, I God mean, okay, damn, okay, bro, let's not to rely on my team in that. <laughs> let's not say it's going to be worse than Apex solo queue, all right? Let's relax oh, with the... Like, that's I, crazy, I, yeah. I mean, I'm that. just kidding. But if the movement is better, listen, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll start here. If the movement is not what I watched in Snipe Stream, I will 100% give it a go. I can get back to you. Yeah, yeah. Because, again, the biggest problem I have with it, man, is that shit. And it just looked like it just looked like it was gunplay, and that was it. Yeah. yeah. Now there was there were some pre nades I was watching. There was some you nade this, you clear a corner, you only have to check the other corner. If you have your crosshair right on the guy, you probably wouldn't gunfight that. Mm -hmm. I was watching some of that, and that shit was all. Um, there's a uh, the maps were a little bit small, and that was fucking awesome. So it was constant gunfighting, super fun to watch. But again, man, I'm dead. The Dude, idea of there being like literally no movement was killing my it's, brain. It's just because it, so. Apex Legends movement honestly is so fun. I remember the first time I ever played Apex Legends and I was just like, I could slide forever. Like this is the most fun I've ever had running in a video game in my life. So it's it's pretty well, fun. Well not only but... that, but COD too. Like yeah, COD even too. COD's movement is like a if let's say Apex Movement came out, you just look at a, like a recent COD, compare that to like a Halo 2, because that's all I've watched, so that's all I can compare. Sure. It to. Like night and day, man. It's like it's like you're playing a whole different genre, you know. So have you played Splitgate? Uh, I have. Okay, I have. so Splitgate. I feel like Splitgate is. I've played a fair amount of Splitgate. I feel like Splitgate is way worse than Halo Movement. Yeah, so, I fucking hate them. Yeah, I, I, I literally, like <laughs> the, the thing about the thing about Splitgate. Yeah. The main difference is you can't like cl clamber. Was it called? Yeah, clamber. You can't clamber over walls in Splitgate, and it drives me crazy yeah i i fucking hate the movement in the game too i i wish that they had like a sliding mechanic and a fucking yeah. prone mechanic in there just for the sake of the gunplay but i genuinely and do enjoy playing split gate because i can outplay someone with a portal you know yeah i don't feel i don't feel so one-dimensional into jump hot chocolate come back hope the guys in my crosshair wait a minute I was looking at the wrong doorway. He shot me in the back with his first burst. I'm going to lose this gunfight. Common. All right. Well, yeah. well like, come, come is, December, yeah. we're going to yeah. have to try to change your mind. Yeah, you're going to be hearing from, from us in a couple of months then. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <you> my, <laughs> make a show, bro. Zach attempting to try Halo for the first time. I'll fucking try it. Zach's Deal. making some Movement hot chocolate better, while I'll his jump is going. Deal. Yeah. No problem. Done. Sounds like a plan. Last thing I want to talk about, uh, and a big announcement last week. 
Faker, uh, I know you're a big LCK fan, uh, the biggest esports pro in the world, the greatest uh, player in League of Legends history, has teamed up with Razor, who we obviously partner with, uh, to design and develop his own gaming peripherals, which I think is incredible. Awesome to see him. He's been a huge fan of Razor for a long time. And I mean, I'm excited to see uh, a big esports name like that partnering with one of the biggest brands uh, in, in gaming. And I think it's going to be incredible to see that. What is kind of your reaction to, to seeing those kind of two big names teaming up? Opium. More Hopium. I love it. We're finishing yeah. the show on Hopium. I think, um, yeah, no, I, I have a lot of hopium that Faker has a good brain because it, that would just all check out, right? Yeah. And as we've seen, there have been some, um, I can't go too in depth, obviously, my own sponsors, but that being said, obviously, there are some, some people leading the industry right now when it comes to peripherals, and I don't think it's close. It'd be interesting to actually see the numbers. But it seems like Logitech has a really good grip on the mouse and uh, keyboard part of things, right? Uh, HyperX can definitely compete when it comes to, like, the keyboard and stuff. Especially but I've been struggling to find a mouse. Yeah, and, and their headsets at HyperX are actually pretty pog. Like, the Cloud 2s are nuts, right? But that being said, uh, Razer has, like, the Krakens. And Logitech has their, like, Pro X, I think is what it's called or something like that. And I think all of those headsets are pretty good. I think the Cloud 2s might be a little bit better than uh, practice review wise but it's all uh, opinion and preference when it comes to headset but definitely when it comes to mouse and keyboard i think uh uh logitech kind of owned the industry right now and seeing a big name like faker with uh such a dominant esports career i really hope that he can go to razor with the leverage that he has with that name and really build a, a good mouse you know uh you no know, offense think... but i've had the viper mini i've i've used all those mice before their rival to what would be like the Super Light or the G Pro. Um, I, I've tried them all. I um, I used the Viper for God, like four months or something. I did like it for a period of time, but I had to go back because uh, it just they're just not on the same uh, playing field in my opinion. And I have a lot of hopium that Faker is going to be able to take that Viper design maybe and maybe make something crazy good because maybe we could Google it really quick. But I would be surprised surprised if he's using like a naga or something you know like a little like six so actually, he's been using stuff. the death adder yeah so so i'm actually a big faker fan long time and my first mouse outside of my uh 999 uh microsoft uh mouse i bought at target when i was <laughs> like eight outside of that mouse itself the first mouse i ever bought was the same mouse that faker used which was the razor death adder and that's the same mouse Perfect. i used the same mouse i used to this day so what i actually imagine will probably happen is we'll probably see a faker branded death adder more than we would see. If it's wireless and it's light, bro, that'd be crazy. Hey, bro, the death I got adder a... is one of the most FPS dominated mice ever. Look at CS. I, mean... I got a death adder. I got a wireless death adder with your name on it, Zach. You just say the word. I'm too. I'm too in love with what I got going on with my. I have my HyperX keyboard that I really like. I have my HyperX mouse pad that I love and. I can't get off of the super light unless something fucking crazy comes around that is just so good for FPS. Because anything else right now, I'm not certain, but... Uh, well, maybe it's too Faker hard for can me persuade you. <laughs> I mean, bro, I mean, uh, what are the dimensions, bro? Talk to me. I mean, I, this is your show. That is one of your products. I don't mind you making an attempt to sell it, but I mean... <laughs> It is not. It is not easy to uh, top a super light right now. It is not easy. Obviously, mice are all preference. All right. Here we go. We're getting the well, specs for the you. Weight. We're getting the let specs for you right now. Hold on. I'm getting the weight. Look at the weight. I'm of looking the wireless death. I'm looking for the weight right now. Please stay tuned. <laughs> Come on. Give me the weight, Razor. Yeah. Come I mean, I, me out I'm just excited. I I, I love. I it. Oh, Zach on the Google game. He's I'm gonna like get sitting on it. here holding the box. I can't even figure it out. CSON's in your DMs right now. Like, I know, literally. Luke, Luke figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, it literally doesn't say. That's hilarious. Uh, but literally, yeah, tell me the, way on. the box is super light. Yeah, the box is light because there's no the mouse in it. Oh, ruin the, I, I ruined Because we're mouse. using it. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. we use we're Razor products wall to wall here in HQ. No, so but I actually I actually do agree best. with you. I ended up buying a final mouse a while back because it's again the same type of design. As the death adder, right? The two buttons on the side, the similar mm -hmm. curve, etc. Uh, and I was a big fan of the final mouse because of how much lighter hey, it was. They just fucking break, bro. Yeah. 
I agree with that too. That's why I have four of them. So here we are in the world <laughs> where, <laughs> where it's like got the backups on the backups. But okay, so are we talking Death Adder V2? Yeah, Death Adder V2 mini? Pro. Death Adder V2 Pro. Okay, so you're looking at 88 grams. Looking at 88 grams. And that's not the mini. So that's going to be a mouse that you're going to be like meant to palm, right? Yep. I'm pretty sure that's like over 20 grams heavier than a. Uh, modern day super light right and then i'm sure you could go through all the specs of like uh its sensitivity and like the laser on the bottom and all the other shit but that is a big upgrade from um what i what was previous right right so mm -hmm. i think if i could give them any um advice right coming from a pro player who doesn't use their products right i think that that weight thing is a really big deal definitely without sacrificing size because Grip is really, really important when it comes to mice. I've tried so many different fucking mice, man. And grip is the most important part. And then weight follows it up. You can do your normal grip that you're comfortable with. That's right. And two is that weight thing, right? No, no one likes pulling around a brick, right? If I can do the same grip on this mouse and it has the same specs as the other mouse and one's lighter than the other, obviously I'm going to prefer the lighter one, right? Absolutely. Now, obviously the specs might not be the same. So I could give... Baker, any advice, right? Big, big guy, hear me out. Hear him out. Drop, drop that weight. Drop that <laughs> weight a little bit, man. Try to try to make it compete. All right, you and, heard and, it. You heard honestly, it here first, Faker. And, drop the weight. Yep. Yeah, drop the weight, man. And, and same goes to HyperX, man. I I have a couple of their mice, uh, mainly just for like product and like uh like I wanted to try them, right? Yeah, the pulse fire. Those... Yeah, yeah, the dart. There's, there's yeah. a couple motherfuckers in there, and um. Uh, I, I fell in love with the keyboard. I actually swapped from my Logitech keyboard to the HyperX keyboard. I actually really like it. Um, the mouse pad, I've used HyperX mouse pad since day motherfucking one. Yeah. I love these bitches. Now I just got an endless surprise. It's like supply. I love it. But I, I could not get sold on uh, their wireless mouse. It was just too heavy for me. And uh, that was the catch for me. And I think a lot of pro players or, or, or more the, the better players, not so much the casual Really appreciate those lighter mice that can do the same thing as it's a uh, better. So that's where I would start. Solid. All right. I'm looking forward to seeing how it works out. Uh, that's going to do it. Zach, uh, thank you so much for coming to hang out with us for a bit here. Appreciate you taking some time out uh, of your Monday. Uh, do you want to just give you an opportunity? Uh, anything you want to say to the folks? Where can they follow you? Uh, what should we be looking out for uh, from you here over the next couple of weeks? Nothing really for me. If if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can. I, I don't really give a shit anymore. I'm like younger, it's uh, just Zach Maser four. Um, yeah, that's, I mean that's about it. Um, hopefully Halo is more interesting than I think it is for the sake of all of us, right? Jesus. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Best of luck to G two and C nine. Uh, hopefully C nine wins world. Topium. Topium. That's about it. Well, I think the, figure shit out. I think the title of this uh, this podcast is the X Rated Hopium Podcast. So <laughs> I, I appreciate you popping on, Zach. We had an absolute blast interviewing yeah. you, um, and uh, I'm excited to see you know what you and the boys can pull out over, of course, these next couple of weeks in Series E, as well as of course the upcoming Pro League. So I appreciate the time once again, and that's it. That's going to be it, folks. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Make sure to check us out on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you're at over at esportsarena.com as well. And we'll be back next week. So hope you guys enjoyed it.